radio. All right, everyone, welcome to this week's edition of the Leadership Blend with your host, Ricardo Rice, and my correspondents, Chris Wyatt. It's the one and only Miss Terry Michelle. All right, and you will hear a new voice today. We, uh, like I said last week, our, our boy, uh, Chris Marshall, went to the real world. So we, we lost him to the real world, and we are replacing him with the lovely Miss Morgan Buckle. I'm so, so we're welcome, so happy to welcome. have her. Yay! All right, so tell us about you, Morgan. Tell, tell us about you, where you come from. Actually, before you do that, let, let, me, let me give the rundown of what happened with Morgan. All right, so everybody know I just got the IBNX, and I have an internship program uh, to kind of give back to journalists, communication majors, people who major in radio and television uh, in college because most of you know I did not go to school for that. I went to school for business and law, and radio kind of found me, and I just kind of stayed in it because I like it. Um, but I know that there's a struggle for those trying to get into communication uh, just from friends and mentees that I have. So I want to extend this opportunity to those who went to school for it because it's what you went to school for. Um, so when Marshall said he was leaving, I did another round of interns to get some content writers and some other things. And uh, when I did the interviews last week, I had no intention of replacing uh, Marshall. It was kind of like, okay, well, if somebody bowls me over, then I could be, I'd consider it. And uh, Morgan walks in, and she's like six foot, and, and she's <laughs> like pretty. I'm just like, okay. But I'm not moved by that, because I see pretty women all the time. Because uh, Terry's here. So I have pretty women all the time <laughs> in my circle. So I wasn't moved by that. And then she sits down, and we start talking, which her resume is very impressive. I will give it to her. And it takes a lot to move me. And um, I actually, me and Terry had already said she's going to be the one that's going to be trouble, because we had already saw her background. So it was like, <laughs> yeah, she's the one to watch. And she walks in. I'm just like, okay. And she sits down. And when she sits down, we're talking, and I didn't really have to interview her long. And she's like, I said, well, what are you interested in? And she was like, well, really? I was like, yeah. She was like, on-air talent. Oh, interesting. So I was like, okay, good. So we're going to the next door to the studio, <laughs> and we're going to go off the dome, but I won't say how you do. And she was like, well, and her famous line, her new famous line with me is, I'm not being I mean, pushy, not but I, what I want it. Sure. And, that, and that's what she said. She's like, I'm not being pushy, but that I want it. So we came in here, and in two seconds, you know, uh, the station owner, Trish, was, was in the engineer booth, and we went at it for about a good 20 minutes, off the dome, no prep, nothing. And when I tell you, she, she knocked it out of the park, and I had no recourse, no other recourse, but to say, you know what? God, she, she's on. You, you, you win. You, you got it. Oh, That's what I'm talking about. So, you know, she, Listen, she's... Please don't believe the hype. He's made it. <laughs> because now, today, if I stumble, if I, if I have nothing to say... Oh, yeah, Everybody's look. gonna be like, "Girl, you went 20 minutes on the dome. What's the problem now? <laughs> <laughs> Don't get camera shy." Look, she's she's not pushy, she's gonna, no, no, but no, she no, wants no. it. So not pushy or shy, but you know, at, by any stretch, and I love it. So tell us, tell us about you. Well, I am originally from Atlanta. I have lived all over Atlanta. Like I said, I've told y'all, my parents both work for the city. I grew up mostly on the east side, though. And Terry and I have that in common. Yes, oh, East God. Atlanta. Um, oh, East I Atlanta. Went to Auburn. Like you, I, I majored in business at first, too, and I couldn't stand it. I, I actually did a marketing internship with the athletic department and realized this was not going to work. <laughs> and I need y'all to release me today. Thank you so much. <laughs> and um, just floated around the um, athletic department, went from marketing to PR, communications, to working with social media, and then eventually landed in more so on the journalism media side of it. And was done. That was it. That's all it took. And now I'm here. And I hope that that story, this will also be a part of my story. You know what I'm saying? The next next place I go when I'm bigger and better, I'll be like, you know, I was popping at IBNX and now yeah. I'm here. Look, everybody keeps speaking like they're leaving me. Look, my end goal <laughs> is, is TV. Like, I'm, I'm trying to be the next Larry King. Like, I want that kind of clout that people come in and they oh, we got a new announcement to make. You need to sit down with Ricardo. So that, that's where I'm going. I want to replace Larry King. That, shout out to Larry King, yeah. but that's where I want to go. He's claiming it. Claiming like, it. I, yeah. I want that kind of clout. Like, and we'll all be all, able to say we started here. You know, you know, I, everybody wants to be Oprah. I, I want her money, but <laughs> I, want to be, I want to be like Larry King. All right, so over the weekend, 
uh, most people that have the the apps and, and you know the news outlets on their phones, all you saw this weekend was immigration, immigration, immigration. Um, so of course, you know we got to talk about immigration because that's what's that's the top uh, bad boy for this week. So let's start with thoughts on immigration. So everybody, share your thoughts on immigration. Like, how do you feel about it? And granted, this all goes back to. <laughs> Trump and his wall to separate us from Mexico and who's going to pay for it. And, and it's, it's a whole what to do. So what are our thoughts on immigration? Okay, well, first I'll go. Um, I just think that immigration, America's supposed to be like the land of the free. People want to come over here to just get, a, you know, get away from everything else that's going on in the world. And I just feel like, like we should definitely allow immigration, like at least to a certain extent, like I'm, I'm for it. So I'm for it immigration you know french montana just got just became a citizen so i'm for it <laughs> yeah. you would you would know that Hold Af- they, they need to screen a little harder no, okay no, i'm okay. only playing i'm only i would playing. only you would know that i would never know that i okay where is he from then he's from uh, africa he's from africa yeah he's african what part i want to say Seattle. south africa yeah I know french I montana mm-hmm. oh i didn't know that yeah he's from africa i thought he was like uh or, latino hispanic or something mm-mm. he's mm-mm. actually mm-mm. um don't actually don't let me lie. To you. <laughs> I, I wanna, but I wanna you know, still okay. So, Chris, okay. what do you feel like on immigration? Well, the United States is full of immigrants, starting with everybody that's here. You come. From, we all have an origin. We have an origin, and then we were we came here. You know, we know that how African Americans got here, and people of African descent, not the ones who took airplanes over here in the last few you know decades. But we're talking about uh, former slaves, but uh, we had Native Americans, and then from there we got people from every country in the world. So this is a home of immigrants. All of this, make America great and leave out everybody else, that is baloney because this country is made up of all the world. That's what makes it, us so dynamic. That's why the United States is the, the country of the entire world, and we have to set the example and I believe it should be open. It should go through all the screening processes that you, you have to go through. Um, some people come in here for asylum. And, you know, if people have got it that are now doing well in this country, have been, re- you know, been co- become citizens and uh, been, d- been upstanding people and not being lawbreakers and stuff like that. Um, because you have some people that just been here, you know, lots of generations and they're not uh some of them aren't taking full advantage of the being an american citizen and some have done unlawful things that are considered so-called native americans of you know being here generation after generation um versus an immigrant like a new immigrant so i'm open i believe that it should be open just like it was open for the united states for england to come over here and set up the united states because england is the mother the mother of the united states this would they immigrated so if, if you're saying, like, I'm going to close the door, it's basically like you get an opportunity, and then once you get in the door, you slam it and say, hey, make it on your own. So I'm, I'm, for, I'm for immigration. I agree with the both of you. I just think it, the problem today in America is that it's just not that simple. Yeah, you have Like, a- there's nothing wrong. I want people to come over here for new opportunities. I want people to have a better chance in life. I would never want to stop anybody from doing it. I think that the problem now is we don't know how to do that effectively for both parties involved. The relationship between us and immigrants has to be we have to help each help each other mm-hmm. it can't just be one-sided and i don't just mean they come i don't i'm not one of those people who thinks they come over here and drain our resources or tear us down we're all if, if they're we're already drained if you think they're coming to take anything we don't really have not that we don't have much to give because there's plenty of opportunity but they're not going to stop me from getting anything so i think that if we can find some way for everybody to be happy that's that's the problem because i don't even think that everybody um, and the government wants them to stay. I think some people are happy with them coming over here for new opportunities. It's just a matter of figuring out a way to make it the best solution for everybody. I think what it really is that people have to be mindful of situations like, you know, terrorist attacks and all that kind of stuff, too, because all that plays a part in it. And I think that's another reason why um, I don't want to speak on Trump, but, you know, just period, mm-hmm. while we're kind of like, uh, while, well, most people I would feel like is against immigration because people come over here and then do disrespect the things that America have been. So that's why I'm getting the whole make America great again thing come back. You know what I'm saying? So, Which is true. I think that's a, a lot of that has to do with the media, though. 
just the image that's portrayed um, about immigrants or mm -hmm. just people from other places in general. The way that they speak about Muslims, the way that they speak about Mexicans, the way that they speak about because you don't hear those things about Russian immigrants. You don't right. hear people. You know what I'm saying? You don't see. You don't look on TV and go. Oh, I don't think we should take anybody else from the UK because <laughs> we we just don't know about them. You know what That's I mean? True. It's Absolutely, just about Morgan. the way that people are those people are portrayed in the media and that shapes our opinion and our the way we look at the world and the way we view them. And they feel that same way about us, which is why they want to come over here in the first place. So why not help them help us? You know, why not make it an easier transition for the both of us? You, I'm going to give an example. And this is way before your time. But I do a lot of that, right, Terry? <laughs> and I have to break it down for Terry. Now, that maybe awesome. Morgan also. But it was a Clarence Thomas uh, situation. Y'all might have heard it, especially in, when you're in college. You hear about all kinds of things, political things. Well, he talked about he made it in, onto the Supreme Court. But he had a big uh, Senate hearing where you know he was charged with like sexual harassment at work and, and, and different things and, and stuff like that but he did make it through and became a Supreme Court justice but when he he had time to talk he was telling people you have to pull yourself up by your own bootstraps and and all this kind of stuff and not talking about the fact and, and like no more affirmative action no more help with minorities and he got help with it but once he got himself together, then he says, hey, y'all got to pull yourself up by your own bootstraps and nobody need to help y'all no more. That's what I'm against. I'm against the, the people who this whole country's made of immigrants, immigrants from Italy, immigrants from Russia, immigrants from Germany, immigrants from from Spain, immigrants from all over the world, Australia, immigrants, Plenty immigrants, of places immigrants. In Asia. But we never once they get them. here, then they say. We making America great, and you can't come because we're and they're not going back and tracing how they got here. If you go back a hundred years, they all were on a boat. I, guess. I mean, and, and okay, so here's the thing about immigrants, and as somebody who's from the country, I see it all the time because I, where I'm from, there's a lot of farm ground and, and things of that magnitude. So during the summer, you see this school buses full of kids and and there's typically an Hispanic. Of like yeah, you see and. Down the street from where I live, there was like a little gas station, and there's like all this farmland. And we knew um, that every summer you'd see buses and trucks of, of I'm gonna assume they're immigrants, because, you know. <laughs> they, okay. If I had to go, if I were to search the bus, I'm not gonna find a lot of green cards. I will just say that. Um, but they would come in on buses, and they actually build houses for them. Almost, honestly, it was almost like slavery, because you see them come in during the summer, and then they build little houses for them to stay in over the summer. Mm -hmm. um, there wasn't great quarters. If I had to say there were bathrooms, there probably was not. Um, but they got them through the summer because jobs like farming, agriculture, uh, stuff like that, let's be honest, a lot of us would not do those kinds of jobs. No. We wouldn't. We would not do those kinds of jobs. True. But they will. And they'll do it for not a lot of money. And they understand what it is when they walk in. So they come in during the summer. They farm the land. They make their little money. They leave and go home. Call it a day. In that scenario, everybody won because, like I said, we're not going to do it. So they do the labor. Um, there was because the little gas station was there. That where they got all their stuff from. So the gas station made money. Um, so it was kind of like a working community. But in the grand scheme of things, who's paying taxes? Because they're probably are not. They're probably not here legally. I mean, they're not paying taxes, but they're also not being paid fair wages. So I don't think yeah. that, that that's True. neither here nor there. Pay taxes on what? My thirty cents an hour. And, Pay and taxes I guess, on what? I don't even have a bathroom. True. How am I? Y'all not even using the water. Pay taxes on what? Devil's advocate. I think, well, hopefully the business that they're helping is going to make more revenue, and then the revenue will be taxed. So in some ways, they still have an effect on taxes because they're going to make those places profitable. They're going to make those businesses that they're working for um, make some money, and then that should raise up their taxes as long as they're claiming it. Um, the which, tax, the taxes, which but is that's, what you get into accountability. So right. you know, I technically have a hundred employees, but I'm only accounting for the people that work in the office. I'm not accounting for the field laborers and stuff of that magnitude. So that way, I don't have to put insurance on them and all these other things. So if something happens, but aren't there migrant uh, worker laws that they don't have to get all the 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 rights that you get? just as like a, a citizen that's working for minimum wage or something like that, because they can be pay, paid less than minimum wage legally as migrant workers, because like like you said, some of it's transient work, you're going from here to here, and so they're able to do it for less. Let's get into the truth of it. That's why they don't want these people over here. It's not because 
they're taking I think that it's being portrayed in the media like oh they're gonna use up all of our resources you just said they will it's legally okay for them to be paid less if they are migrant workers instead of citizens so why on earth if I am a large corporate corporation why would I want to grant you access into this country so that you not because I don't want you over here clearly I do because I need the help Right. But why would I want you over here legally so now I have to pay you more? And so, I get Morgan, less. are you saying you think that the corporations don't want the people? I believe they, they want them because they work for cheap. They want them because they're they about they profits. Want, they want them because they want them to work for cheap. They don't want them to be legal immigrants. That's what I mean. Yeah, that's what okay. I mean. It's, it's yeah. you, but you can't, you can't do that. You have you to. You can't do both. You can't have, don't. Yeah. Because they're, they're just taking advantage of them. I mean, well, they're Agreed. not citizens, so. Who says we have to be fair? Like, but they want to be. So isn't that that's the question? If yeah, we don't have to be fair to legal, I mean to illegal immigrants. But if they want to come over here legally and they want, to, I mean, well, I take that back because most people don't come over here legally. But if they want to come over here and they want to do the right thing, they yearn for to be better. I understand totally stopping people who come over here and mean this country ill will. But most of those people, especially not with these stories that Trump is talking about, these snatching families away. These people are not. There was a woman at a DACA center or somewhere on the border, and she's breastfeeding her baby, minding her business, and in the midst of her breastfeeding, they come and grab the child, take the child away, put the mother in handcuffs. That don't, mm. that that lady was not hurting anybody. You know what I mean? It's not about, so to them, it has nothing to do with, yeah, we want your work, but we don't want to treat you as, it's slavery. We don't, we want, like you said, we want your work, but we don't want to treat you as fair human beings. Right. Those people have rights too, even if we feel they don't have rights in our country. They still have the basic That's human right. rights. Okay, so let's be honest. The funniest thing about this is somebody had this same conversation about African Americans not that long ago. This same conversation. Yeah, somebody had exactly. this conversation about us not that long ago. So, and we didn't even ask to be over here. Exactly. So with that being said, should we be more sympathetic? Should minorities be more sympathetic to immigrants? I'm sympathetic. Especially, at particularly African American, uh, African Americans. Because not too long ago, they had this same conversation about separate but equal. Well, true, because they know about working um, for no pay, you know, uh, against against their will. Um, they had no, no uh, body to represent them, even in like a, a judicial way. And they were working for free. They weren't compensated. Their families are now... People are still affected from that because it takes generation after generation to build up wealth. And from that being cut off from um, things that you've worked just like you're working probably harder than the people who are wealthier than you, you're doing all this labor and you're not able to get some of the pie of, of what makes America great wealth, you know, wealth wise, that you're cut from that resource but you've done all the labor, and, and so I, I believe that African Americans should be sympathetic because they do personally, they, and they're still facing the residual effects of what happened to their great greats. You know, it, they're still suffering from it. So I think it would make you have a little more empathy. I'm not saying you're not going to say there should be more guidelines and strict uh, codes to, to handle these things, but at the same time, you got to have a heart. Okay, well, I feel like you do. I mean, you, you, you can sympathize with them, of course. But at the same time, it's just rules to everything. It's a way to do true, everything. True. So you're saying have illegal immigrants come over here and then we're still supposed to treat them fair. Like, no, it's one thing to say, okay, I'm going to come over here illegal and then I'm going to, you know, get legalized and, you know, whatever, wherever, go through the process or whatever. But and then say, okay, yeah, I want these rights and I want to be treated fairly or whatever. I just feel like it's a process. You just don't come over here True. and you just think everything's supposed to be good and gravy. No, it doesn't work like that. Like in that, if that's the case, then you know somebody needs to make me <laughs> make me rich or something. Like it doesn't work that way. You know what I'm saying? Go ahead, it really Terry. doesn't Terry work that president. way. Terry for president. Terry for president. But I think most people come over, or most immigrants when they get over here, or at least look at it like this, because they don't have the money to to come over here legally. Imagine what kind of things you must be going through in another country that would even after hearing all of the hell that's going on yeah. over here or what you might have to deal with if you try to sneak over here imagine what they are possibly running now from. listen to this i worked in the school district for two years and i think it was last year where they did like a don't come to school come to work day you know we were missing like half of our student population 
at the school I was in. And and in school districts, everything's about the numbers of the pupils. You know, every when it gets down to numbers, that's how you keep your resources. So when them when they didn't show up, there was a protest. That it was about Trump's decisions. They did an opt out of work and they kept their children from school. We saw that. Hold up. If we change the whole dynamic of the United States and we somehow we had a way to just put those people up in the air and just see what the United States would look like, it would it would look really different. It really would, because even though there's some difficult things with it, they are a big part of the, the United the States in some serious economy. ways exactly. um, there, you know, there and they could be future some things to the to the country because. Everybody has a gift, and we don't know who that person is. They they might be the one with the cure for one of the diseases here. Let's we see. don't know who's who. But as as you said, Terry, there has to be some strictness. But if you go back and trace it, I bet you some of these same politicians that got all the mouth, they, they got some of those immigrants working in their business. Trump's wife. Okay? They got them working in their businesses, <laughs> and they have some personal relationships with a lot of Im immigrants that they're on the other side of it when they go out in public and they're out there on Fox News and CNN and all those stations, they're they're looking like they're so hardcore and all this stuff. And then, you know, if we would trace it to their business, you would see like, hold up now. You got all this, but you you got you you got a big padded payroll. But that's what I there. mean about like it, it. They don't want them to be legal legalized because they they're helping them way yeah. more than they like. You know what I mean? They mm -hmm. don't want to legalize them because then they'll have to pay them more, which costs them money True. Right. that they don't want to lose. So it's not, I think that because of that, it, that's is a part of why you feel the way you feel like it has to be fair. And they're using up our resources. Do you feel affected all right, right well, now? All right. So let's put a pause on this. We're going <laughs> okay. to take our first break. When we come back, we're going to actually look at the details of immigration. What is uh, DECA? All this good stuff when we come back. So stick around the Leadership Blend with your host, Ricardo D. Rice. Hey, everybody. It's Ricardo D. Rice from the Leadership Blend, simplifying your leadership. Thank you. 
All right, everybody, welcome to this week's edition of the Leadership Blend with your host, Ricardo Rice. And when we left, we were getting into the correspondence views on immigration. All right, so everybody wrap up your view because we're getting ready to get into the details and the meat of immigration. So wrap up your view. In a nutshell, what is your synopsis of immigration as it currently stands in this, this country? Well, I think it's, uh, you know, it's everything's a work in progress. That's why we have politicians, we have uh, citizens, and they balance it out. Um, I just think they just need to tweak it, but but look on the human element of it. I mean, st anything that's hurting somebody, pause. If you're hurting somebody, if you're hurting their family, if you're hurting um, somebody that's already here, I mean, they're not they're not outside of the the walls of you know the territory of the United States. I think look on the human side. We 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 just get so caught up into what the law says and what this says, and we got you know parents and children being separated and all kind of stuff. I, I'm, you know, I think we need to, we're not in no uh, cold world country, cold uh, war times um, where you're just cold blooded. I think we just got to look at the human element and work to um, help these people. Well, I don't want to sound cold hearted or anything, but to me, my take on immigration is just this simple. I think it's a great opportunity for people, you know, to come over here and to make a better life for themselves, of course. But at the same time, I just feel like nothing is just given to you. Like, you have to work hard for it if that's what you really want. Like I said, when we were on break, you have people that's out here homeless one year and millionaires in the next two years. You know what I'm saying? It's just how hard, it's, it's about your work ethic. So, you come over and you tell us what you, you know, what you're gonna take and what you're not gonna take. You know, it's just that simple. Like that's how I feel. So if you're gonna come over here, just work hard. I agree, but they can't do that from jail. <laughs> well, that's it. That's all I have that's to true. say. That's true. That's true. I totally agree, but they can't do that from prison. I'm from East Atlanta, so you know you got to watch your back. Just so why you <laughs> oh, no, well, Morgan? Why you mention prison? What made you mention prison? Because well, they they locking these people up. Yeah, they, 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 they that lady who they said they were they okay. were in a border detention center. They took her to jail. All right, so let's get to the meat of this thing. All right, so most people that have been listening to the immigration uh, stuff that's going on, you're hearing this phrase DECA a lot. So what is DECA? DECA is the acronym for Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. It's a program that was created in 2012 by the Obama administration, and it allows young people that are brought to this country illegally by their parents to get a temporary reprieve from deportation and to receive permission to work, study, and obtain a driver's license. DECA applicants, in order to be an applicant, you had to be younger than 31 years old when the program began. They also had to prove they lived in the United States continuously since June 15, 2007, and they had to have arrived in the U.S. before the age of 16. Uh, those signing up for DECA must show they have a clean criminal record, they have to be enrolled in high school or college or serve in the military, and their status is renewable every two years. So that's what DECA is. So when you hear DECA, that's what that stands for. See, DECA is making it... It's a good, that's, see, that's what I'm saying. It's stuff out here that's making it good for immigrants. See, I'm, shout out to DECA, because I like that. <laughs> all right, so shifting. All right, so why was DECA created? They were unable to find legislation to remedy the protect, to protect minors who were already brought to this country, no fault of their own. So in essence, this was not created for the older immigrants. It was created for what we were talking about uh, with the, uh, the lady nursing, and they come in, They came and took her and put her in handcuffs. It was to protect the kids who had been brought over here on no fault of their own, and now that they're here, to keep them here because they've already, they don't, okay, case in point, a child is brought from El Salvador at age two, mm -hmm. and now he's 10. He doesn't know El Salvador. He only knows America. Mm -hmm. So in theory, they thought it would be fair to give him the opportunity to become an actual legalized citizen because this is the only place he knows which is what you're running into now. You're deporting kids back to Mexico, El Salvador, just as examples. They don't know those countries. They were raised here. That's all. This is all they know. But do it protect their parents as well? It used no. to, and now it doesn't anymore, and that's the problem. So now whenever those children come over here, because the only reason we're hearing about this now, because immigration has been an issue. Yes. We're hearing about it now because they're bringing, these families come over here, they get to the border detention centers, the, fam the parents or the adults that they come with are taken to prison, and those children are then pushed into our government agencies. So if they are born here, if they are infants when they arrive, toddlers, whatever, they are then basically foster children. So if there are already family members that they have over here, 
they can go with those family members or they can wait to be placed. The problem now is that these children have been, they're going missing. Oh, so okay. we're just not accounted for like in the between here I'm reading an article about it now on um, NPR.org it says nearly 2,000 children were separated from adults at the border in six weeks and I think that was between somewhere in April and May like but those two months 2,000 children have gone missing and that's just in that's just in that time span you know what I mean so imagine as long as this has been going on just even this year alone if 2,000 children went missing in six weeks it's June 18th. We we way many more six weeks in. Yeah. Okay. And still got a, another half to go. You know what I mean? So they just aren't. I do. I agree with what both of y'all said about immigration. We just have to figure out a way to put not only. Because now it's a problem. It's a matter of protecting children. And it's But one it's not thing. even just protecting the children. It's not it's getting them not separated from their families. That's like a big thing too like especially if you have to go into the foster care system and your mom's in prison like yeah. or in jail like that's just a bit much yeah so okay so I, that's that's what we're up against so you're getting into the issue of legislation and the reason this is even on the board because DECA was temporary because they could not find a solution uh, to it so the Obama administration created it uh, through executive action in June 2012 so this is not a a old policy. This is only what is 2012 is 2018 now. Mm -hmm. This is only what six years old, mm -hmm. and it was a temporary fix. So in essence, it was going to have to come up anyway because they have to decide what to do. So now you have Trump, who when he came in office had already made it abundantly clear he was not for Im he was not for immigration in its current state. So now the question becomes: All right, so are we keeping this? Well, actually, he's already already took it off the table. Are we reforming this, or are we going back to having nothing, and we really having to deal with border patrol and all that, all those things? On Friday, Trump was interviewed, and he said that I hate the children being taken away. The Democrats have to change their law. That's their law. So he's not even he's blaming Democrats, but the law he's referring to is actually something that was it was let's see, it went into place in 2008. It passed unanimously in Congress and was signed by Republican President George W. Bush. So not a democratic law at all. And it was focused on freeing and otherwise helping children who come to the border without a parent or guardian. It does not call for family separation. So either way, he's wrong. At this point, I'm tired <laughs> of, I'm just, it's all, it's Big all surprise. fake news. I'm sick of it. Big I'm tired surprise. of listening to him. And I don't, it's, it sucks, but I don't know how they're going to fix this. Not with him in office. Yeah. Because, um, they're getting everything they want. This is what, when Trump was on was campaigning about that wall, and Jeff Sessions was all over the place. This is what they wanted, and this is exactly what they got. So in essence, there's the middle ground because you have to decide what you're going to do with the legislation that's in place, but then you have to figure out if you're not going to let it stay, what are we going to replace it with? So in the middle ground, this is what happens in the middle ground. So now everybody's, we have all these kids that are unaccounted for, and until some legislation is passed, all this stuff is only going to get worse. So what does that mean for people who live in America? Well, eventually, it, this is what I tell people. When stuff like this starts, it becomes a, a avalanche. So first it starts with immigrants. And like we were talking about last week, did we get to it last week about the uh, the voting? I don't even think we got to it last week, but we were talking about uh, Ohio and, shoot, now I need to look it up. We were talking about Ohio and how after two years, they're able to send you a notice, and if you don't respond to that notice and you don't vote in four years, they can strip you of your voting rights. Mm. All this is connected. This is, this is how stuff starts. It seems small. Oh, well, you know, they're not voting anyway. It's fine. You know, we're giving them a total of six years to say something. Okay, well, people don't check mail like they used to. Right. And, you know, you're probably not going to send an email because this is still government stuff, which is still using uh, mail, the mail system. So people who have moved or people who don't check their mail, two years does not take long to pass. So by the time you turn around, you're no longer eligible to vote. So people go, oh, it's only six years. Yeah, but a lot can happen in six years. And in those six years, now you're telling me I can't vote at all. That's Ohio. Eventually, other states are going to adopt this. So what happens? Who typically does not vote? Black people. Well, Minorities. Not, I've been, not even just right. that, though. It's like a certain <laughs> age group, too, like as far as demographic goes. So, But again, it still yes, cycles back true, to minorities. Too. Minorities mm -hmm. and certain age groups tend not to vote, or they'll sit out. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, I'm not voting this year. That's one year. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, I'm not voting this year. That's two years. Before you know it, four years have passed. You're no longer true. eligible to vote. This is how it all starts. So it's the point is, gradual. this is how it all starts. Mm -hmm. So now you have typically minorities with the voting, and now you have immigrants with being able to cross the border. 
what does it sound like? <laughs> what is what is? And again, this is the picture that people do not understand the power of legislation and the power of lobbyists and all this stuff. This is what happens. This is how it starts. Oh, it's, that's a little small thing. Don't worry about it. Yeah, the small thing. They start writing in other little clauses. True. And, you know, when you don't say anything to your representative in, in the Senate or in, uh, your congressperson and you don't say anything and you don't send people to voice their opinions, if you don't voice it, no, there's nothing to be heard. Right. So if people don't feel like you care, if your re representative of your district doesn't feel like you care about a certain piece of legislation, and let's say they're biased on it anyway, and you don't call their office and you don't like, you know, really rally and, and, and they're like, well, they don't care about it anyway, so I'm not even going to vote on it. Mm -hmm. Bam, legislation is passed through. And a lot of times we don't understand the decisions that are being made until it's too late. Right. So, so we, you're saying a, um, apathy. You're saying a lot of apathy. And is it, it's an old story. I don't know where it came from, but it's about a, a, a frog in, a, in a, a pot of water, and the water starts off cold, and they just turn up the – on have it on the burner and it just turned the flame up very uh small in the increments of the increase and so the the frog is sitting in this pot of water just as enjoying itself and it doesn't realize over time that temperature has been turned all the way up and it's boiling to death and it's a it's a saying it's an old old, I know saying, I know what you're old about. story of just letting things go for a long time it's just like in a relationship if, if, if you don't handle your business you don't take care of the weeds in a relationship with a whatever type it could be business otherwise your things will grow the next thing you know it's like oh my goodness the thing started so small and mm -hmm. if it was handled and confronted it would not be anything but right. if it just gets left to its own devices who knows this thing could become the blob well and but that's the process that people do not understand when it comes to politics with politics, they are very patient people who will wait for the tables to turn to for their opportunity. We expect True. to see some big headline in the news tomorrow. Oh, well, you know, they just changed legislation. No, 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 no. This is the process. And they put little pieces in. And this is why you, it takes so long when there people go, well, why does it take so long for them to pass a law? Or, you know, why does it take so long for legislation? Because it's the language. You know, they put stuff in. And you got to remember, there's two sides. There's Democrats and the Republicans. Mm -hmm. Everybody has a vested interest. So when they're making legislation, everybody's putting in language. Oh, well, it should say this, and it shouldn't say that. True. And we're not talking about a two-page document. We're talking about legislation that is anywhere from 100 to 50 to 200 pages that has to be combed through. And, you know, both sides have to comb through it, and both sides have to understand the language. But it's language that we're typically not going to understand. Right. So when you don't understand the language, people can say whatever they want to say and pass right. whatever they want to pass. This is why it is important that you have people who are reflective of your interests in the House, in the Senate. This is why it's important for us to vote. It's a picture that people do not understand the picture. So when you don't vote and you know, let's say it's a predominantly African-American community and they allow somebody who's not African-American to represent their interests in the Senate or Congress, what does that mean? That means if a white person is, is the congressperson or the senator of my district and he's never spent time in let's say East Point or Bankhead, and he's <laughs> never lived there, how does he understand your struggle? Right, so when right. he goes to vote, these things are going to be foreign to him. Oh, we're talking about uh, food stamps and EBT and stuff like that. He's never done it. So when it comes to voting, True. he doesn't have an empathetic yeah, bone in his body helps. because he's never experienced food stamps and stuff of that magnitude. Right. And if you don't say, if, if Shaquira around the corner don't say nothing about it and she doesn't get her and, and Kilola and all them and they show up at his office or call him to look, we, under, we hear something about legislation about food stamps. What does this mean to me? You know, and there's nobody, no advocates in the community, you know, saying, hey, they're getting ready to change the food stamps you're getting. You know, and there's no voice explaining this and synthesizing this information. What happens to these communities? Legislation is passed. The stuff that they use that helps them feed their families and stuff is no longer available. And by the time this legislation is passed, it's too late to repeal it. Because you can't just be like, oh, we changed our mind. We were just playing. We, we going to give you back your food stamps. We didn't know. We you know, didn't know. and right. ignorance of the law is not an excuse. Right. So us not taking the time or making sure we have young people who are advocates for this legislation and stuff that's coming down the pipelines to really get out in the communities and talk about it, this is what happens to the communities. And this is how it starts. So, you know, immigration is a conversation we definitely need to have, especially minorities, because, hey, it's them today and could be us again tomorrow. Right. And that's, that's the reality of it. That is true. So, you know, people, hey, those that are listening, true. especially us minorities, 
we need to have this conversation because again, we could be next. This voting thing that's going on in Ohio, I am not gonna lie, it makes me very nervous. But it's good that you know you're talking about it or whatever, because a lot of people just we maybe we just need to be more educated. We need to educate right. others on it. You True. know what I'm saying? Because True. if you don't know, then it's just like because honestly, I didn't know anything about the um thing in the voting right in Ohio until well last week until you mentioned it. So it's just like if you know what I'm saying, I feel mm-hmm. bad because everybody Ricardo. He made a little eye at me, so I'm like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> if someone, you know, if you just don't know. There you go with that eye again. <laughs> but, you know, seriously, no, seriously, for real. Like, it's like when you don't know about something and you hear about it, it's like people really need to know about this kind of stuff so we can help. Well, what I think there. is people think that they don't have any effect on anything and then they get apathetic. That's why some groups like Black Lives Matter, mm-hmm. they made a big difference because people start saying, hold up. I do matter. Right. And I mean, even, you know, other groups also start saying, hold on, I matter. And I then, matter. Yeah. I'm a senior. I matter. I'm a mm-hmm. I'm a veteran. I matter. You start thinking of it, even though they might have been, you know, for a specific group, but it also includes your, your own issues, and you have to start thinking in blocks. Just like people had, look at what happened, like, with Starbucks and all of these type of things. When they realized their great effect, things like Roseanne Barr and all those things, they realize they're going to affect a group of people that are going to stick together, then you got to make some changes. If if not, you're not going to have those consumers, you're not going to have those viewers, you're not going to have those listeners, and you, you, and yeah, you need, get the and you want green, mm-hmm. everything at the end of what they're, they want is green, they want the, that money, and they know we spend. So if, if, if they mess with us too hard, any of these groups, that are, have lobbied and got together and start saying we do matter. One of us equals ten thousand of us, and ten thousand equals a hundred thousand of us. But it all starts with the person, the one person. Well, and you got to remember, you know, it for me and Chris Wyatt, it looked different because in our day, you know, you had the Al Sharpens, you had the Jesse Jacksons, who were in these communities. They were True. speaking up. They were synthesizing this information for their communities, so people were more informed. It's I know funny, about Al Sharpens. Well, I mean, you know them now, but they're like, honestly, to me, they're, they're shells of their former selves, to me. They, they just don't. They, and, and I agree. Just and I mean, looking at older interviews and stuff, it's not the same. They don't have that same energy. That same, and they can't. They're like True. Exactly. much older. Once you, especially seeing all the things they've seen and been going through all the things they've been through, I'm sure at some point you go, you know, I think I'm tapped out. I think I've done, yeah. even if it's not enough, even if it's not everything that should have been done. I did all I could do. I mean, did you see Nelson Mandela at the end of his time? I mean, he was a, he's been through so much. He had um, advocated for fighting back against the oppressor and all that. But as, as you get older, you, you change some of your, your thinking, you're trying to do more of this bridge building versus I'm just going to confront the issue and battle it any way I can. So the, the way of, it's just like a, a, a basketball player. When they first come in the league, they're, they're doing all this, running around, slamming. Then they got to get smarter. And if you watch Jordan by the end of his career, that boy was doing all kind of different stuff that he didn't have to be um, a, a acrobat to do every every game, and he start being smarter. So I think as you get older, then you're trying to pass the torch. So it's, it's really this generation got to get get that, that feeling that they had in the 70s and in the 60s where you're like, you know what? I want to make something happen. But I'm going do. to be an but activist. You, that's how they and, started Black Lives Matter. And I'm not going to count on anybody else. I'm not going to count on the older leaders and all that. Because like Ricardo said, some of those leaders are doing different things. And that's okay. Because it's a, it's a whole new group here with some current thinking. Because you can't think of things out of the time. Because some of the thinking you have will be out of the time. And you're trying to deal with what's going on now. So it's, it's really the time for this. This well, generation. Again, but again, I think the fear is when, what do you do when, they, when you have so much information at your fingertips and you're never taught how to decipher or how to prioritize the information you're given? At any given moment, even when, when I'm looking up stuff on here, at any given moment, we're bombarded with everything that's going on around the world at any given moment. And you sometimes these kids can't even decipher what's local versus what's federal. Like, it's so much going on. There's so much that's trending. And... You know, you get into this, and I think that was the fear of our generation when the internet started becoming popular. It's mm-hmm. like, okay, so, because our generation was big on gatekeepers. So who's the gatekeeper of this information that's coming in so fast? 
True. Who's gatekeeping it? True. You know, it's who's... supposed to be the media, and they're doing a terrible job. Well, when you have different kind of media outlets, and everybody has a spin they want to put on it, to and you can't really you blame them, but you can't because. Okay, so my outlet caters to African Americans. So that means, again, I have to synthesize my information to my particular listeners. Okay, well, my group is Hispanic. So now I have to spin my inform- synthesize my information so that they can understand it. Everybody's having to synthesize to cater to their audience. Right. Well, when your audience is global, what how do you, you do? deal with a global audience? And then you get to a point where it's like, okay, well, I can't synthesize for everybody. So I'm just going to put it out there. Mm-hmm. This is what I'm hearing. So this is what's going out there. So then you start getting into alternate facts because nobody's fact checking. It's, it's just a whole, again, you get into gatekeepers. We don't have enough gatekeepers. And in minority communities, we don't have enough voices. So how do we fix the problem? Because it's a problem. But you know, honestly, you know, like how we speaking on like leaders and stuff. And this just could be my opinion. But I think that a lot of people kind of, are kind of afraid to like speak up because how many leaders do you know, like, are really like you know still alive or you know what I'm saying it's like a lot of time most of the leaders that everyone know like they were just slowly getting assassinated like you know just different mm-hmm. all kinds of stuff like people was dying so like Martin Luther King like he had a, a peaceful protest movement and you know what I'm saying like people like he still died you know what I'm saying so True. a lot of people just right. are afraid if they speak up then you know what I'm saying then they're targeting themselves so that could play a problem into it too. Like even with the like um different movements, how you saying like Black Lives Matter, some of that stuff. Like although I haven't saw that myself, haven't seen it personally, but you know what I'm saying like when everybody's like marching and stuff. Like you know when back in the day when they was like doing all the marching, then you have police officers coming out and trying to like hit them. It's just like it's a lot of backlash behind it. So some people are just maybe m- might just be afraid. So stand up. All right. So on that note, we're going to go ahead and take our second break. And when we come back, we're going to take a look at leadership in today's world. So stick around on Leadership Blend with your host, Ricardo D. Rice.
All right, everybody, we're back on this week's edition of the Leadership Blend with your host, Ricardo D. Rice, and Chris Wyatt, Terry Michelle, and our newest, Miss Morgan Buckles. And when we left, we were getting to the dynamics of uh, immigration, and, and we were actually, it segued us to look at leadership, you know, the paradigm of leadership in this, in this phase of the United States. Uh, and I was saying that in me and Chris Wyatt's time, we are slightly older. <laughs> just slightly um in our time you know we had the al sharpton the um the i don't say martin luther king we know, i'm not that old but uh -huh. we had the al sharpton the jesse jackson andrew young in his prime yeah i mean well is andrew young wasn't he with um martin luther king and all them but he was still doing a lot he, he said, helped with getting the olympics it. he helped with getting the olympics uh, here wait a minute i'm not that old so i'm not about to um <laughs> um about to go there with you but um you know and yeah. the point was in our days and it wasn't just uh in the social economic stuff we even the artistry was different so you had public enemy and all those boys you know campaigning Farrakhan also to vote. Farrakhan. I, I was going to save him for that controversial last. but he brought up a lot of subjects but the funny thing about Farrakhan is if you listen to him today He's become a voice today. Yes. Back then, it was like, oh, God, Farrakhan's a Muslim, so, you know, he's going to talk about Allah and stuff. I actually watched an interview with Farrakhan, and he actually made references to Jesus in the Bible. So his whole stance has changed. Yes. So I was going to save him for last because his dynamic has changed. As a result, he's become a voice for this generation, whereas in our generation, he was not a voice for us. It was more of the Muslim movement. Now he's become a very generalized voice which shocked me because I was passing through something he did on YouTube and I really wasn't going to listen. But people started talking about it. I was like, okay, that's interesting. And I listened to it and I was like, whoa, this is not the Farrakhan that I knew from the 80s, the early 90s. Like, he makes a lot more sense. Mm -hmm. His message is more <laughs> general. Because at one time he was really pro-Muslim. So mm -hmm. it was all of this and they should be doing this and we're not dealing Separation, with the white man and, yes, and black blah, nationalism. Blah, blah. Yeah, now it's yeah. like, you know, it's a generalized concept and he's talking about African Americans as a unit versus Muslims. So his dynamic has changed. But my question to you two is, who would be your voices in this generation? It's this crazy time. because, you know, to me, only leaders that you really see, at least for me, you know, for speaking for myself, um, you see like Michelle Obama and, Pre well, not President, I guess now, but Barack Obama. And it's just like, if you really, 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 really think about it as far as like media and stuff goes, we have people that's like T.I. that's out here, you know what I'm saying, and talking and speaking for us. It, you know what I'm saying? So and not even like, because he's black and he works in like a rapper, but it just seems as though because you can be upset about racism and still, you know, like turn up. You know what I'm saying? But <laughs> well, look at Kanye worry. saying he wanna run for president. I Foolishness. mean, but I don't, and that's he what need I mean. Not run to anywhere, but <laughs> I don't know. He needs help. But I, tell him, please Morgan, don't tell get it. started on him. I think as far as leaders goes, people in our generation look to we make the wrong people leaders mm. right by the things that we choose to support and. I don't think that that is necessarily because technically I'm a millennial, which is includes anywhere people from between the ages of anyone born after or before, I'm sorry, before 1997 and it goes up into like the thirties, like the mid thirties. Right. So, oh, so that means me too. Yeah. You too. Well, I'm trying to think because you know, my, well, how old are you? 23. Yeah. Me too. We're millennials. Okay. I, but so, I think they're breaking it off. I think y'all actually, Y'all are in between millennials and Generation Z, which that's my dissertation stuff, and I got to go back and look at Generation Z because I thought that wasn't a thing, Generation, but apparently it's it a is. thing. It is. Generation Z starts in 1997. I know for sure because my sister was born in 97, and we're separate generations, and it seems like that's ridiculous because we're only three years apart, grew up in the same households, but even looking at her, I can see we are much different mm. because of the like just societal things yes. that we've seen mm -hmm. and the way we took them in. So I think, like I said, we make the wrong people leaders because – the leaders of the black, black, the Black Lives Matter, the Me Too movement, a lot of these movements we see were not only founded by black people, but black women. So mm. it's not even just about, oh, we don't have leaders, it's about who are we choosing to support and who, are, because for the Me Too movement, you wouldn't have known that a black woman, did you know that? I know about the Me Too movement. But did you, no, no, did you know a black woman started that? I didn't know that. Right. With, with Bill because Cosby. And, well, and I'm, Me Too, the Me Too movement had already, like, hashtag Me Too was already a thing before that. Okay. The women who were hurt or affected by the Bill Cosby thing, just used it as a catalyst to talk more about it. Right. But Me Too had been a thing, and okay. it was founded by a black woman. But you don't know that, mm. right? Because we aren't talking about it until a white woman gets involved, until mm. a white woman stands up and says, oh, Me Too, I was also affected by this, now we want to listen. So 
So I think, again, it's just about the people that we make leaders and the things we choose to and not even just us as consumers, but with the media, it's a it's a two way street. But, but it's I the same thing. Oh, we don't. It's the same thing we said. But that point you made is the same point we made last week. The only reason suicide came up to the magnitude that it came up was because Kate it was Spade. Kate Spade mm -hmm. and Anthony Bourdain. That is not new, and the statistics have always been staggering. But because it was two icons, then it was a conversation we wanted to have. True. Do I think it was a coincidence they both happened to be white that started that conversation? Mm -hmm. Absolutely not. You know, but, but again, it's about the right people getting involved to give the voice movement or mobility. Right. I mean, I wasn't going to say anything, but she was just, you know, just speaking off what Morgan was saying as far as, like, we make the wrong people leaders. I just feel like a lot of that has to do with guidance. You know what I'm saying? Like, it starts with a foundation, and that starts in small, like in your households, and you know what I'm saying? So I just think it, like, again, it just starts from the start from the household from the beginning, like how you're raised and what you look at, what do you see in the media, what type of TV shows you watch, like if your mama's making you read books when you get home from school, like all Definitely. that stuff plays a part into it. Yeah, but again, we talked about that last week. You start getting into the dynamics of households, and especially, and you know, because I stick with African Americans, that's what we are. Mm -hmm. When you start looking at the statistic of African Americans, you're starting to see a lot more single parent households, primarily with a mother who's working two or three jobs, you know, she doesn't have the time to be home with those kids to make sure they're doing homework, you know, to make sure they're not watching the wrong things on TVs. And then, you know, you have these electronic fail-safes, which they're electronic. Somebody's going to find a way to get around them. Right. So the parental guidance control stuff, those kids figure out how to maneuver that crap, and next you know, they're watching porn. So, again, you get into <laughs> but gatekeepers, and we talked about this last week, the removal of gatekeepers for us, we don't understand the importance of the gatekeeper when decisions are made on our behalf. We looked at it last week with schools. When they start taking out guidance counselors and they start taking out uh, after-school programs and stuff, you got to look at the statistics. Who do those programs primarily affect? They primarily affect minority people. So when these decisions are made and we don't voice our opinions and they're removed, our kids suffer. But no, again, these are not the conversations we're having. Right. And I agree with you. People who should, should not be role models have become role models. I think we had, we're in a leaderless time. That's how Trump won. Now, Trump won, and he was the most unconventional person to, to ever, probably in history, to be able to just go from business and have all his bad credentials. I mean, even all the way up to the election, he's, he's you know, the, the charges of... Uh, Groping women right before yeah. the election, all kind of stuff, and not, and these are verifiable things. We're in a time now where anybody thinks that after seeing him do it, they figure I can do it too, and and the, it's really no leadership. Like Terry was saying, it's really almost as if what's going on is making people start leading themselves better, like going all the way back to the grassroots. All the way back almost to when this country was a pioneer country, where you were going across the frontier and you had to take care of yourself. You didn't even have a government. It was laissez-faire. You were, you, you were without the federal government. You were trying to take care of your business. You take care of your family. You're trying to make sure you have some property. You're trying to make sure your kids are taking care of getting educated. You were involved. You remember I talked about this two weeks ago about they said the, the, the research on families eating dinner together and now we're in like a dinnerless time with our families and, and our, our little nucleus. We don't eat together. We don't talk together. We, we're all over the place. We're in our own bubbles. We're like a leaderless nation right now. That's why Donald Trump could win in such an unconventional manner. And, and people like Kanye are saying, I might as well do it too. And, and somebody like Ben Carson who does surgery, he's somebody in the government who, who nobody would ever think in a million years, why is he in government? You know, he can't even tie his shoes. <laughs> so what? why is he out there? Because it's it's wide open. It's a it's just reach out and grab it, even if you have no background for it. And I think it's coming back to pushing the people to take care of themselves first. And they when they take care of themselves and look out for themselves, their self-interest and their community's interest, I think we're going to get some some self-leadership just off of the, the lobby and other people. Well, okay, so, so segue into that, because I was looking at statistics for uh, voting when it came to Trump, so you brought that up. 
the way people voted is, is really funny because I'm looking at this article and it actually broke it down into the different uh, ways and they put Hillary up against Donald Trump. So <laughs> the funniest thing to me is that the people who were less educated were the ones who voted the most for Donald Trump. That's, oh, absolutely. That's, that's absolutely funny to me. Because mm. um, they're misguided. It, that's just the Republicans play all day, she, night long. They, they, yeah. Because if you feed into the negative things that they think about, when they, if you feed into the ignorance. So as a low-class Republican, as a low-class, low-income white person, you associate sometimes a lot with racism or white nationalism or things that make you feel as though you are separate because you're white and that's it. And so that's all they can, Donald Trump and people like him feed into that. Because now it's like, okay, well, if I can just play into making you feel like mm -hmm. I'm white too and I think that we are better too, you're going to, that's all. Using that's anger. All you, that's Using all you needed to hear. Exactly, because that's much more powerful than, well, not much more powerful than love, I think, but it's a much more powerful convincing tool. You know what I'm saying? You play into somebody's, what the things they don't like. So if you come to the person and you say, okay, I don't like white people. I mean, I don't like black people or brown people. Just like you don't like black people or brown people. And I'm, we agree on that. And I'm going to help you with that matter. They forget all about everything else that is, that's not in their favor. So now you just put somebody in the house. Because really and truly, if you looked at it, you, you'd probably be better off being a Democrat or liberal, to be honest. Okay. But you don't want to get into that. All you think about and all you see is that face is being portrayed on the media. And you know, just like they do, y'all don't like black and brown people. That's all y'all need to identify on. And they don't think about the rest. Well, I mean, and I told you. I think you, they call you know, them demagogues when you just work off people's emotions and it's not even based on if it's going to be beneficial for them. It's just that leader is so egotistical that they work on your emotions. That's why it's so good to make things, make your choices non-emotional. And that's how, you know, when I was younger, I used to make emotional decisions and, you know, like protests would happen and you just want to jump into everybody's protest. And then all of a sudden you realize, hold up, the people at the front of this protest, I don't really, I don't agree with what they're saying or doing. Mm -hmm. So if you just run out on your emotion, you're basically like a bull running after a red cape. So I guess, I, so I guess my question is when it comes to leadership, what's more important? Is charisma more important than experience? Because in essence, that's kind of what you saw with Hillary versus Trump. Trump has the charisma. People mm -hmm. like him. Oh, and absolutely. honestly, I felt like that's why he won because people felt like, oh, I've seen him on The Apprentice, you know, mm -hmm. and, and blah, 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 blah. People felt like they could relate to him versus Hillary, who has all the experience and all the knowledge, but people didn't feel she had the charisma. So in your leader, what would you prefer? Do you Guess want what? somebody? They liked him for, you know what? They liked him for his honesty on a lot of stuff. He He's blunt, but... You know how people say, I'd rather hear, I'd rather know how you feel about me than you be a fake person and you you backstabbing me That's every true. chance you walk away from me and I'm not around, then you telling me your real feelings because either I can deal with that and we just keep rolling the way we have to roll or maybe at some point we can find a bridge somewhere because I really know you got a big problem with me. Mm -hmm. but, and so with Donald Trump, you know how he's feeling. He's not hiding anything. The old generation of politicians, everything's done behind closed doors. Right. And so you don't know how bigoted they are because they're not going to let you know it, but your decisions and your on what's happening with you with legislation mm -hmm. and what's happening in business, you're going to know how bigoted they are because you're not going to see yourself and you're not going to see no money in your neighborhood. Right. But see, with things like with um, Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton, a lot of people was a little, I think a lot of people was afraid of um, Hillary Clinton becoming president because, like, she was a woman, you know, that played a part in it. A lot of people saying, like, okay, they thought we was going to start, that was going to start itself a whole lot of wars because it was a woman. Like, that was going to see it as a sign of weakness. So that you know, that's just what I'm hearing. And Terry, didn't you mention something about Michelle, Which the, the crazy, Obamas? Every war in yeah. history's been started by a man. Terry mentioned a ma uh, <laughs> Michelle Obama and, and the Barack, Barack as being like some of our leadership because during that Democratic convention, Michelle and Barack like killed that thing. Like I was driving, I'm actually driving mm -hmm. from Florida listening to them. I was like, oh my. It was unreal. If he was going for his own presidency, he was <laughs> he was rolling, and Michelle was just on point. But, then but guess what? When Hillary came, she was the letdown. When I listened to her, I was like, you didn't take that torch and go with it? They set you up so good. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar? Come on, man. This is an all-time score. He's out there for you. You got everybody plugging, plugging, plugging. Then you come up there and look like somebody's P. 
PTA meeting, mama, and 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 just looking <laughs> off. Uh, what I'm saying is, that's, 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 uh, what I said, she didn't bring no energy. She didn't um, bring the energy that that the people had set her up with. That, yeah. I'm not against whatever, but what I'm I saying is, you. she came very corny and she lost everybody. All that work everybody did. All of those people who who were siding with her, uh, actresses and actors and. Everybody putting their name on the line, and then you come up there and stand and do your politics talk. You you didn't have no. It was like non emotions, as if it was so scripted. I I was like done. I was you know that with the emotion, as far as you know, Donald came with his. He whatever he doing, he hard on it. So and you're I, saying I, that you, charisma, yeah. charisma, absolutely. She had no charisma, which means even if you're better, if you can't sell yourself, I mean, it's like so. People who are talented and they're sitting at home trying to see how they're going to get paid. How I'm going to make some. You're talented. Get yourself out there. Yeah. yeah. Get your, let me know what you got. Don't be. Do what um, Boys the Men did. They found that Michael Bivens and they sang their hearts out and, they, and then they was on point from there forward. Yeah, you had to do what you got to do. You got that elevator speech. You better have it ready. Yeah. So let me ask you this, uh, Terry. So to your point, do you think that. Do you think it's more of a woman, or do you think who the woman was? Because do you think no. it would be the same thing if it was Michelle Obama running? No. See, I, I think it more so was um, the woman who the woman who the, <laughs> Y'all have to see the, who the woman motor. was. But at the oh, same yeah, time, man. at the same time, Express I do yourself. think it, a woman played a lot, played a big part into it because. I don't, you know, what other countries, you know what I'm saying, are really ran by women. Like, you know what I'm saying? I feel like, and because men, and because men are, um, because men are really like the main focus and everybody's always, it always like everything is really male dominated. So Uh, when a woman come in, it's kind of like, Hmm. But if you ask me, hey, what was that shirt you had last week? Hold on, Ricardo. The future is female. Ooh, it you is. know what I'm saying? Like, you're talking about would it have been the same if it were Michelle Obama? No, because she's not only a woman, she's black. It would have been worse. And yes, but she, might she have had the charisma too, though. If you think charisma is winning presidencies, I don't think he won because he was charismatic. I don't think it had anything to do. I don't want to say it had nothing to do with his energy. He didn't win because he was a you know happy go love it. Look, you know what I'm saying? Like he was just. But oh, yeah, I'm with it. I'm here to get everybody yeah. <laughs> on the right page. No, it's because he fed into those people's. He fed into the ignorance, and he knew if you feed, if you feed into hatred, if you feed into disdain for a an, an entire group of people, that's all you need. But isn't that politics? Don't yeah, they all play on? True. Doesn't all politics play on something that's intrinsic? Absolutely. That, but would they you want have that to thing play to be on racism? something. No, I'm not saying which one is the the ethical or moral, but all politics play off of something with you. They're trying to get some kind of emotional charge for you to go and take yourself down to that polling polling station. Okay, hold on. First pause. I just want to say this for all the listeners. Uh Uh-oh. Pause button. (laughs) When Chris gets excited about something, you can hear it right right in his voice. I'm like, okay, okay. This is Milton thing. I just had to make that. I just had All to right. say that. So on that note. <laughs> Thank you, Terry. So on that note, we're going to go ahead and segue <laughs> to Chris Y and his, wait, what? Segment. Take it away. I'm going to be real calm about this because <laughs> Terry acts like I can't get like, you know. I mean, you everything just about you just, But I go have ahead, a. Turn the party up, Chris. I'm a, like, what you need you to know say? what? My cousin said this to me once. We were at an engagement and she said, you're a bon vivant. And like, my cousin is a doctor. So I'm like. What is a bon vivant? And I have a, a I have a very large vocabulary. And I looked it up, and it means a lover of life. She said it means a lover of life because every time we get together, you always animated mm-hmm. and this and that. So I, I, I got you. Can you say that for me one more time? It's called a what? bon, B-O-N, mm-hmm. a separate word. It's like French. And a vivant, V-I. Bon v- vivant. Bon vivant, B-O-N. And then the second word is Vavant. I think is either Latin yeah, You're not spelling that part V-I-V-A-N-T. Okay. Vavant. Bon Vavant. Bon Vavant. It means you love life. So, okay. I you know, it, we're at a, <laughs> wait, what moment? Because it things that appear a certain way, sometimes they're not what they appear to be. So I, I'm looking through um, US t- USA Today, and I see... And, you know, every week they got something new coming out. I mean, this technology is just unreal. And we got to really, as Ricardo was saying earlier, if you if you let something, if you're very tippet and you're, you, you're lukewarm on things, you just don't know what could happen if you don't make a stance. You have to make a stance or you're just fodder out here. So it's talking about Microsoft works 
to cut out the grocery cashier. Okay, now this is Mr. Bill Gates and his company, and it's technology over human employment. Okay, so um, Microsoft is following Amazon's lead into the grocery business with technology that cuts out the cashier. It may revamp a previously failed attempt at checkout free shopping, a high tech shopping cart. Microsoft is working on technology to eliminate checkout times at stores by tracking what shoppers add to their carts. It has shown samples to retailers and talk with Walmart about a collaboration. Such a product would set up Microsoft to rival Amazon Go. So Amazon has uh, already um, got into this market. Um, Amazon custom, custom design store that uses cameras and tracking technology to cut out the cashier. Amazon has one store open in Seattle and plans to open more in Chicago and San Francisco. Now, cart-based technology is old. They, they tried this. IBM tried this out 20 years ago, said Phil Lampert, a, gro a grocery analyst who runs the Supermarket Guru website. The problem is maintenance at the store level of the unit is too costly, and people kill the unit by banging on them trying to steal and also trying to steal them. Mm. Stores such as Kroger's and Stop and Shop tested them, but they found most consumers just use them as calculators just to calculate their products, and then they still want to go to a cashier. So um, they said that it's certainly one way to deal with the number one cost facing, uh, cost facing the grocery industry, which is labor. And um, this is this is my problem with this. Anything and, to get out okay, of somebody. So well, they're creating this Bottom technology. Y'all okay? seen that thing? P the points, the points <laughs> of this line. is that people in economically at-risk groups, they could use those jobs. I'm going to make a few points with this. Um, if you were in an economically challenged situation or neighborhood, and you're, they're talking about cutting out some jobs, and you're trying to get some jobs, you're trying to get yourself up and take care of your children and your family or yourself, hearing about all this efficiency and I got to cut this, um, I, I think that this is, a, is an affront to that. Um, cashier jobs are great sources of employment. This is my opinion now of employment for students and seniors. You know, this could be somebody's uh, a, a retirement job and they, they like greeting people and being nice and doing customer service. It's actually not paying you some outrageous salaries anyway. They might have to manage possibly how much hours people get versus just eliminating people. But these this technology by Microsoft and um, Amazon Go, uh, my thoughts is that business without thoughts of these are businesses without thoughts of human consequences, um, and I and I believe that people might have to do like they do with some businesses and not support them like you don't you 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 don't support things that aren't environmental fr uh, mentally friendly, um, pet friendly, and things like that. That if they're not human friendly and looking out for uh, people's well being in your community, I think you got to stop supporting them. Um, and this is just my opinion because these all this technology is not looking out for families It's looking out for profits and that's where I'm at on this that it looks good It looks like oh man I'll be walking through the market and my products will be getting scanned and I'll go through but at the end of the day You just cut out you cut out a hundred jobs trying to just be you you're trying to get this cell phone life that we have to have everything as a microwave everything mm -hmm. And we get it by us living like this. We like speeding our life up. We're speeding our life up so fast. Health is going down. It's not a good thing. Sometimes you got to use some of the, the old with the new. It, it can't everything be new because everything new not good for you. Thought. I mean, I, I to be completely <laughs> honest, he said you, we when you spoke about um, people in lower income like areas or communities. I'm not worried. They're not putting these there. They're not. They're not. Well, they're yeah, that's not, true. That is true. That is true. That's true. Amazon. I've heard about these before. Amazon has one of these stores. They opened this that store last year, and it's only still in Seattle, which is very white. They not. You think you're gonna see one of those on uh, Candler Road? No, I didn't think so. <laughs> it's not happening. I don't even. It's, it's just not happening. I mean, I'm I, sure that it'll happen eventually. I just don't think it's gonna happen everywhere. And truth be told, the people that have those jobs that need them the most. You ever worked at Walmart? I worked at Walmart when I was in school. Really? Mm -hmm. They're not getting rid of them people. They don't ever have but three cashiers on the line okay. anyway. Okay. So if you really think <laughs> okay. they get rid of three it. people, it's not happening. Because only because 
think about how large a Walmart super center is. Yeah. And think about the areas in which those super centers are typically located. In places that don't like, you know, cater to people with lots of money. So mm. those are the people who need those jobs and those are also the people not also the people who steal, but people steal. They're not doing it. It's not it's not happening. Well okay, I mean I don't work. Well actually say, I mean there are certain departments even if you were to scale down things, there are certain departments you can't scale down. A robot is not going to be able to watch the computer monitors for shoplifters and be able to alert um, or get a what are you going to get a robot. A robot's going to send a message to another robot to go handle a human. Like loss prevention is one you probably won't be able to get rid of. People, as much as we gripe about the fact that there's only three cashiers at Walmart, if the self checkout is overrun eventually you're going to look for somebody, some human person to, to ring you, you up. up. So you're, it's always a catch-22. Now, this was a, a fear we had years ago, that when computers, because, you know, you see these movies, the Jetsons and all this stuff, and, you know, the hovering cars, and we all swore, especially in our generation, oh, my God, when 2000 comes, you know, we're going to be in flying cars. and but I'm still waiting in this 2018. I was about to say that. Maybe I'm, I'm, I'm still waiting. It's coming, technology, though. though. <laughs> And as you hear the crickets, because I'm still waiting to be riding in a hover car. <laughs> Actually, for that man, I'm still waiting. Hoverboard. I was about to say, I'm still waiting for a hoverboard. Yeah, we just want that thing where you don't have a, the thing where you're rolling on mm -hmm. it. I'm not impressed. I don't even, <laughs> I'm not impressed. And I don't even think it was that great. Because, again, you, you start getting into fads. And I've noticed that's, that's what we do. These, these fads or these, for lack of a better term, these 50 minutes of fame that we give people it's because it's wrecking our our the way we do the way we live our lives. It's you know, just you, trends though, Ricardo. Yeah, but these trends come and go so fast. It's different when a trend lasts for years. Like going back to the public enemy movement and things like this. These trends lasted five to ten years. These trends now are here today and literally gone tomorrow. And then you're left a generation who's who's used to a hype. Oh, well, you know, now we today we have Black Lives Matters. What's the next cause? Oh, well, now we have the Me Too movement. What's the next cause? Mm -hmm. So you find a generation of people who are so microwaved that they can't think a full movement through. It, it moves, but once it stops moving, where does it go? Now, now let me give an example. Now, I'm a, I'm a big Starbucks, Starbucks kid, Ugh, right? So I'm there, be. like, just about every day. You would be. But I love <laughs> it because of the human element. I mean, you get greedy. You get service. You get everything. You get... If, it was, if I was talking to a computer... Are you kidding me? It's like going in a hotel. If everything was all computerized and all you do was check in, go to your room, don't see nobody, your room gets checked in, uh, somebody does it when you leave out, and then you come back and you're just like this humanless environment. I don't want that. I'm a, as we said earlier, as my cousin called me, a mm -hmm. Vivant. I love the engagement of people. I need that human element. I don't want to be in some... Soul food restaurant that all I see is a machine and it's shooting out collard greens. I'm not going there. <laughs> yeah, me too. Okay, I like you to understand? With people too. I need some people, man. Yeah. All right, you know, fine, whatever. All right. So but just to hold on, I gotta say this. You know, I always come with my little my comments. So when um, Ricardo was saying like what the whole trend thing, I'm gonna say this and leave it. That's why you're always supposed to remain classy in a world full of trends. So it's it's gonna be okay, uh, like, you know. Oh my god! Oh, so you, we're not dealing so with clashes like, this week. So ah. Hold on, like, you remember I know that though. Ah. Oh my god! So, I mean, so apparently Terry thought that was a drop the mic moment. You know. So she, oh yeah, she yeah, that was yeah, a drop yeah. the mic moment. Mm. That's fine. So you're gonna pick it back up because now we're going to <laughs> your segment. So take it away, Terry Michelle. Okay, so now it's time for House of Secrets, you guys. And if you don't know, it's just basically when we have callers call in or we have um, people send us letters or whatever anonymously. And we just kind of like give them advice or whatever that's going on in the world. You give them the, the number so that they, they want to call Okay, in. yeah, of course. So if you want to um, call in, the number is 678-944-7944. Again, that number is 678-688-4269. There's two of them, right? No, 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 no. That's see, Ricardo, see, number. you wasn't, you, he wasn't, he wasn't listening. Okay. One, he didn't one get the morning, he didn't get the morning tea. Number, just okay, so okay, so let me do it. Let's, let's do it one more time. Again, the call-in number is 678-944-7944. And to listen, it's going to be 678-648-IBNX. Thank you. Um, so, again... <laughs> It's time for House of Secrets. You're not going to check me again. I don't know. I don't no, know. no, no, no. I who going to yeah. check me, boo? <laughs> who going to check me, boo? See, that's the trend. That's the trend. Look, that's the trend. I just told you. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, okay. So, I want you guys to give me your opinion on this, okay? And, of course, Morgan, you too. 
Um, so a woman and her fiance, they've been together for five years. And um her husband, of course, had were well, not her husband, her fiance. They were together for five years. Well, they was question. together for five years. Okay. Um, and but they just recently engaged. got engaged. Okay. And the uh I guess her fiance, he had an affair, of course, and the girl <laughs> ended up getting pregnant. But the problem is that the wife well, I guess fiance, whatever, the woman, she can't have kids. So she wants to know, like, what should she do? What advice would you give someone that she like, you know what I'm saying? Like, because kids kind of play a big part in that if, you know, especially you want to get married and, you know, start a life. So what would you guys do? <laughs> Time to slide, baby. Go ahead and pack them bags. Take that ring with you and adopt. Just as you got to go. TTT. Okay, you got great life. So are you saying that the the – the guy cheated, and he made a baby with somebody else. The fiance yes. has a baby mama now. That's okay. not his fiance. Okay, but then the one that he's with, it, are they and they're they're staying together? Yeah, like this? he still wants to be with his wife. You know what I'm saying? Like it was like a one time thing, but a baby came after it, and he's like, "Well, his wife can't have kids." Well, oh, and they chose to. What move I yeah, what like I would say, still be listen, like he wants to still be with his listen, wife. He I, just. What I would say is, look, she has that issue if he cheated or not. She still has a, a I can't have a baby issue. So but if that issue, if that issue wouldn't have stopped them from being together, like if she, if 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 he had not made his major mistake in life, but if if they would still have been fine just being together and they're okay, like he's not saying I'm leaving because there's there's no uh, possible kid in our relationship if he would have been fine that way i would say she needs to if she's giving him forgiveness that's that's the big thing about forgiveness human forgiveness is so fickle because if you say i forgive you for that then we just dealing with your what you got to do it's just like meeting somebody who got some kind of legal issue are you with the person are you not let them be as soon as you found out about it you got to make your decision but if you're with me you're with me through the other things and we're going to work that out. I have a child. But if me and you were going to stay together childless because we love each other, then I would say that's what it's supposed to be. Y'all just keep on being taking care of each other. And that child is the, the, the responsibility of the man that he has to take care of that responsibility. But if y'all were if that didn't happen and y'all were going to stay together anyway, then I would say stay together. Don't let that child issue ruin you because you're not able to have a child i would say if y'all were going to do it in without that extra scenario i would say stick it out okay um, ricardo you know i'm looking at you come on i'm, I'm ready to eat yeah his chris, face looked like he chewing because, on lemons because um chris of course you know i always have to say it's chris i'm sorry you know but he's you know he's married so he's giving it from a married perspective so it's kind of like okay yeah i get it but for me you know i've been in that kind of situation it's like do you really like how Morgan said? Do you really want to raise somebody else's child? Like, especially if you know, like, is that being like, you know, what I'm saying again, is that being selfish? If you're kind of like, okay, well, you know, we kind of agreed that, you know, you you knew my situation, you still wanted me to, you still wanted me to be your wife. We agreed that we was going to do this, and now that you have a child on the way, and that's something you're excited about, is that something that you really, really want to? Okay, deal so with. she can't have kids, right? Not yes. that she doesn't want them, she just can't have she them. Can, she just can't okay. have them. I agree with what he's saying, because if you work, if you're going to take me back just for cheating, you're going to have to take me back with this baby, too. So right. I agree with that, but yeah. I need more details. Like, did we, right. did we, are we already, <laughs> I just, it's, something's not adding up here. Like, did, how did we, end, were, were we not together? Is this a break baby? Is this like, <laughs> did you go out and cheat on me and didn't use protection and now baby. there's, like, I didn't get all I the have details. A, you like that phrase? Like, and now I have a stepchild? Like, there's just too many, there's too all many All right, so, so let me, let me say this. This, this is actually a personal situation of mine. So that's why you see the look on my face because my, my parents are still married. They've been married for, I'm 38, 30 something years. And my mom, we all just found out in 2010, my dad has two outside kids. By two different women, so my, my I see the struggle of my mom trying to. Uh, it's not even co-parent because they're grown. Like I have a, a sister who's I think Janae is twenty four, Rel was like twenty two. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, my half brother died, um, but that still left Janae, and she's my half sister. Um, so I see the struggle my mom goes through with, and 
they're great people. My my half sister. Actually, the funny thing I tell people all the time, my half sister is more like me than my real sister. Like we we just have that in common. And her mom was a really sweet woman. And this happened at a time when my dad was a little local celebrity at a Diamondback club. He owned a club. And I remember that because I'm the oldest. So I remember women throwing themselves at him. And my dad, he's he a player. He looked like me, so he's good looking. <laughs> you know, he looks like me, so he's good looking. Two, and, two. You know, I, I remember, you know, the fights they used to have about the possible infidelities and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So it was a running joke between me and my, my sister's sisters that daddy got outside kids. So when we got the call in 2010, it was just like, oh, <laughs> the joke was real. Okay. But I've seen the struggle of my mom trying to have a blended family of sorts. And it's also a struggle for the child because Janae knew about us, but she also knew we were off limits. So she could never reach out to us. But she knew us. We didn't know her. So, you know, she lived a life of having siblings she could not communicate with. She's the only child. Oh, this baby went has siblings because baby's there. She's not. Yeah, she's so not I mean, but just the, the blended family aspect of her trying to deal with the other dynamic that comes with another child, you know, or comes with a child, period, that's not yours. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, uh, baby mama is such an ugly term. But a, a, another, a mother of a child that's not yours and a child that's not yours, that's not living in your household every day, that's not being reared by you every day. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a funny dynamic. I mean, in this particular scenario, you know, she really has to count out the cost. You know, of again, you're not rearing this child every day, so this child is not going to grow up in your home. Um, the visitation that comes along with it, the relationship you not only have to have with him but her, mm -hmm. all these things play a part in it. So she really has to weigh the cost. And then a better question like Morgan said is, does she even want kids? Because if, aside from her being barren, did she desire to have a child? Because if she didn't, that's another issue. But then well, again, I don't get. if she does, and they do choose to get back together, you could look at this as like, now we have the baby that I couldn't have. I mean, or they could adopt. Wanted. That too. This is messy, honey. I, 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 don't, <laughs> I don't know what to tell guess, you. Guess well, what? Well, Ricardo telling us that was a real secret because, you know, he I didn't expect you yeah, to Yeah, so, look at look, that. Look, look I, so I'm still. Well, he said still, it, it, he, he could fully understand it because yeah. of a personal experience. What I what I get from this is mm -mm. when you when you start a relationship and where it goes, even if you T D J said there's no perfect marriages. People tell you all this when they had them 30 year anniversary. Oh, look at them. They just so happy. He said if they knew what it took to get to that 10 year anniversary, to that 25th and all that, that these are not everybody's working through something because they said it was some relationship book. They said two people getting together like two foreigners that got to know each other because I got to get to know you. You were raised a certain way. We're two different genders, and I got to figure out a lot of stuff, and it, it comes from your family history. It comes from how you, all your experiences and all this and your tastes and this and that and what your talents are. I got so much to figure out. It's like going, going to a new country. I'm going to Australia or something. So... If that's the case with each relationship, then that that one that has its own challenges is the same like if you had a substance abuse problem and I have to deal with do I really is it about me loving you or not and going through these whatever that challenge is or is my love kind of is a part time or it's fair weather when it's going sweet I'm right there but as soon as there's a bump I'm out. Okay, husband. <laughs> I know I was like what Tell I forgot he's married. Okay, for those who do not know, Chris White is actually been married twice. Right? Yes, I have. Chris has been married twice. So his expertise, I was like, what is he? I forgot he's been married twice. So he has an uh, understanding of the dynamics of, of marriage and things oh, of that matter. Absolutely. I yeah. personally, if I never get married, I'm okay with that. Um, I view marriage more as a partnership. Um, I like the dynamics of my parents' relationship. It's an old school relationship. So my mom literally works because she really wants to. Um, and her only job was really to buy clothes. Uh, cook and like little stuff. My mom is rotten. I and I Pam, <laughs> I love you, Mama, but you're rotten because anything. And we all I honestly, me. This is his last siblings, day on his own show. You know, <laughs> I honestly, me and my siblings, we're all spoiled because Dad was the sole provider. So when it came to any, even today, if something happens, case my mom had an accident the other day, about a month ago, and immediately daddy was there and he was given derivatives. Okay, well, Ricky, I happen to be home. So, cause I'm from South Carolina. So this happened in South Carolina while I was home. So by the time it happened, the first person mama called was dad and dad started giving derivatives. All right, Ricky, you go to the hospital with your mom, you know, call your sisters, let them know. And that's what we expect from him because that's how it's always been in our house. Mm -hmm. Dad 
every Saturday he sat down with his little table. He put out all the bills. He was calculating bills every Saturday. So we expected it. It was like, make sure daddy has his table so he can sit down at it, do all the bills. You know, and like I said, mama would work, but she worked at the courthouse. And, you know, she made money, but she didn't help pay bills. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when all this happened, it was like, okay, well, mom, let's really look at this. Are you really ready to be on your own if you choose to leave him? Whatever you decide, I'm fine with. But let's weigh the cost. You've never been on your own. And, you know, devoid of dad, did you really want to start dating again at 60? Uh, Like, do you really want to start this over again at 50 to 60? Like, Mm -hmm. I'm not telling you to stay, but I'm telling you to weigh the cost. Like, it's it's a... a, Guess what we never got? I didn't get an age... If you had put it to me like that, my mom would be like, oh, you're right. I'm going to go back in. We didn't get an age on this (laughs) this couple, did we? Well, they didn't tell me their age, you know. I didn't want to... Because I got something here. Now, Muhammad Ali said if... If you took the person at twenty and you and you saw them at fifty and they were the same person, they wasted thirty years of their life. Mm-hmm. So if you start out in a relationship and y'all both gotta work this thing out, just say day one to day ten years from now. Mm-hmm. If and y'all might have not came in totally equally yoked and everything's all smooth and mm-hmm. gravy, y'all came with y'all whatever. But if y'all were willing, if it was true love in there, I mean, I'm talking about that love that it it it, it can challenge you. It can it can get upset. It can do all of that. It can whatever. It can almost have the cops at your house. But it's still in the, it, at the end of the day, that's my woman. That's my man. That's my this. That's if that's there. I done see some people with some crazy stories that you look at now and you say, what y'all had all that and y'all still together. It I think it has to do with like. How if your love is mature or is immature, Absolutely. and it don't have nothing to do with age because you can be immature with your how you feel about a lot of stuff forever. You don't have to ever stop being immature. But if you got something solid and you're like, I like something about you that it don't matter what's going on as long as you're gonna be willing to move from where you were to a new place, and ain't we not going back there, and you're not gonna be that level you were. I can roll with you, but if it's if it's just if not, you just be bouncing from person to person because every time somebody make one mistake that it seems like is that deal breaker, then yeah. you out because and you can go your whole life. You can go through a hundred people like that because you keep you're not you're not willing to go through something uncomfortable. I mean, but would that be like more so of settling? Like you know what I'm saying? If that's ooh, one thing that you just I, decide that you like, no, well, baby, I'll be young, dumb, and single and alone. <laughs> okay, okay, I'm not doing it. All right. Okay, so but these are the opinions. This is my take. All right, so even in my business relationships, I would rather us have an argument out the gate because then I can assess how you handle conflict. Okay. Because most of the time, that's what happens with marriages. You know, we get into this marital bliss and everything's great, and then you have one argument, and you go, well, I didn't know you was gonna shut down whenever you get mad. True. And you go, I didn't know you was gonna argue for 30 minutes after the conversation was over with. Right. If we'd had a conflict at the beginning of the relationship, I can assess how you handle conflict. Because however you handle conflict is typically how yeah. you handle a lot of things that happen in your life. And then I also don't think that we have com- r- appropriate communication about appropriate topics. Yes. When we get married, before we get married, we should have a conversation about finances. How Absolutely. do you spend money? Yeah. You know, what does your bank account look like? How much debt you got? Because at the end of the day, love is great. I love love. <laughs> I love love. Oh my God. I, to, to my people, <laughs> I love love. But I also believe in hey, partnership. Love. So you, You're okay. so loved. So now that we on it, everybody, you stand with that baby? Uh, are we talking about that situation? Mm-hmm. About the outside. Wait a minute. Are you staying with, <laughs> you staying with your fiance? Bring, bring them to bring them about it. the baby. Yeah. I mean, if okay, no, I'm gonna tell you why not. I wouldn't be in that situation because we'd had a conversation. We already have a problem. The Boom. problem is you don't want kids or you can't have kids. So my next question is, do you want kids? Well, I want kids. So now we got to discuss options. Are we gonna have a surrogate? Do we want to adopt? Mm-hmm. What are we gonna do? So I wouldn't be in this situation because we'd have had that uncomfortable conversation out the gate. Mm-hmm. Well, I don't even think it was about the conversation. I think it was about the cheating. About the cheating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The yeah cheating. but if they so, had a conversation about kids and stuff of that magnitude, then it, I think they would have went a different way because then we'd have been working on having a child. So me, you wouldn't have time for infidelity because we're working on having a child, whether that be adoption, which is no, the process. No, he was working on having a child. <laughs> <laughs> but again, if they would have had that conversation, again, but everything boils down to communication. I'm, right. I'm not saying that's communication completely is it, key. but that's ball. We don't like having uncomfortable conversations. We don't like talking about topics that are so taboo. We don't like doing these things. If we got over these humps, 
a lot of the unnecessary stuff we go through, we wouldn't be going through. Exactly. Uh-huh. Like how you say, you don't like talking about conversations. Like how last week we was trying to play Spicy uh, Out of Night. That's what I was going to say. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of taboo, oh, yeah. I was waiting to get to he that He played anyway. the fifth <laughs> last week. He played the fifth. Uh, but I also believe Uh-oh. in making well-informed decisions, and I opted not to make oh, that So you call, need your not, lawyer here. <laughs> oh, no. I can, I can Is that what you're my, saying? I can represent myself. Yeah, pre-law. I'll, look, well, I've been would like Would you like a do-over? You know what, fine, I don't care. Pass me the base. Okay, okay we here gonna, we go. We have here time we today. We got, <laughs> matter of fact, so listen, this is how it's going to go. Everybody's going to get two, to, again, because we have Morgan here. We're really, I want to, maybe the guys need to just get one. Morgan need to get, like, five. two. We should all get one. Give she her get five. She, she need, like, three. Yeah, we need, yeah. We need to know the team. You Look, know, yeah, get I, it ready. Yeah, let's like get Morgan's the team. I like Morgan's almost a female yeah. me. She ain't going to pull no punches, so I, I'm concerned. Oh, no. Okay, so here you go. Oh, but my hands too big. All right, so for those who don't know, we're doing uh, what is it? Hot, spicy, or spicy, hot, or not? So these are our uh, leadership-ish hey. questions that are in different arenas and different areas that we are are made to answer. So the noise you hear is us it's fishing it's, in the bowl. It's like an entertainment segment. Yeah. You know, t- we been, we hit on all that serious, serious, serious. So we going. All right, so Morgan, what you got? Hmm. Who had the most influence on you growing up? Oh, girl, that ain't even hard. <laughs> um, I'm thinking, mm, who had the most influence on me growing up? I had my grandma. My grandmother. Why? Oh, boy, why? Because, okay, so I know I said I'm from the east side, but growing up I lived on the west side. And my grandma, my mom, like my entire family is from the west side. So a lot of times when my mom was at work or my dad, like I said, both of my parents worked for the city of Atlanta. So when my parents would be at work or... They wouldn't be doing much. I spent a lot of time with my grandma by choice and by force. And so <laughs> being with her, we and I have a lot of cousins. I think my grandma, may be, well, maybe not to some people, but I think we, in total, she may have, she had 20 plus grandchildren. So mm-hmm. I felt like the favorite because I liked being over there and I spent the most time with her. And I was one of very few girls. So I got to see a lot of things and learn a lot of things from my grandma that she couldn't teach my guy cousins, you know? So we had a very special relationship, definitely her. I have oh. a very special relationship with my grandma too. So I'm I did to mine died, and I live with her, so I got to see. I, yeah, all of my whole, grandparents um, are deceased, so I totally feel you. I still have my grand, my other grandma, but this one, my grandma early was I spent, I lived with her for the longest. So I, you know, got to when she went on dialysis, I was taking her. So, you know, I call her Earl. That was my girl. Earl was my girl, but she died, I think, two years ago, two or three years. What's ago. What's up with that? Like older women having, like my grandma's name was Willie Mae, Willie. And Earl. Yeah, and then she had a, my grandma had a friend named Johnny and a friend named Lou. Those are some What's real daddy's that? girls, aren't they? <laughs> I mean, because it's like, like they, a lot of people get their dad's name Luan, in some Willie way. May. Well, I think they were good down down south like ish names because yeah. yeah. like grandma's name was early. Um, my aunt, my one of my favorite aunts is Julia May. We call her Aunt Julia. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's just it's a yeah. southern thing. Yeah, it's a southern thing. They're southern belle. Okay. Where's my next question? I need some a little spice. I got a good one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Go ahead, Chris. Go ahead. Am I up? Yeah, it's your turn. Let me hear what you got. Uh-oh. You're going to like this one for me because you you just think. You uh, should have yeah. had the trap music when I would love to hear what your favorite trap song is. You should have uh, got that one. I didn't get that last week. All right. This is this is good. Like I said, I'm I'm transparent. Oh, um, God. Here it is. Would you rather fight all the time but have great makeup sex oh, or never fight and have mediocre sex? Oh, my God. All right, let me give you this right here. And like I said, as he said, I'm married, but remember, I've, I've been single well, also. You woke, you woke David up. So I've, I'm, as you see me now, you don't know all about me, truthfully, until that's why these are so good, mm-hmm. because you get to find out some more about me. I got because you might think, wow, he's a, such a... People think I'm so straight-laced, and they don't know what I play in my car. You understand? Mm-hmm. That's how it is with me, because I'm, I'm a lot of things. Mm-hmm. So... Um, would I rather fight all the time but have great makeup sex or never fight and have mediocre sex? I'm not a person about anything mediocre. So let me go there. <laughs> I, I'm a Scorpio. Okay. I'm a oh, Scorpio. Whoa, 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 wait, wait, whoa. What I'm saying is... You we, a Scorpio? Yes, I am. Wait a minute. How many... I'm, I'm a Scorpio. No, I'm, somebody oh, said something I'm to me this Scorpio, weekend. My last somebody said was. something to me this weekend when I was out actually what? buying furniture and then somebody said what's your birthday because they saw my driver's license and the lady said oh i'm also a scorpio and she and everybody was like scorp 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 it's it's it but what i'm saying is what i would say with this if i'm if i'm fighting with my partner and we we still have love in it hold on 
I'm good with that because if you fighting, it means you care. When you stop fighting and you just go to we walking around each other and we don't have nothing we ever challenge each other over, I don't want that. That's like and that's like bad. being that's being away from me and not being away from me. Because if your mind leaves me, you're gone. Right. So I'd rather have the fight and that great makeup <laughs> than than uh, uh, somebody who we just all cool and and looking like some kind of crazy family show, PG thirteen. But then we have no spunk nothing to our our relationship yeah. we ain't trying to get out of town and find some place and get away from people and do stuff <laughs> uh-uh. I'm, I'm with the i'm with the fighting and the making up all right then chris did i make some sense <laughs> okay I'm, me too mm-hmm. ricardo it's your time mm-hmm. it's your turn uh mine is no i should have did like he did last week i don't i don't want to answer this one it was I'm, I'm <laughs> oh it right, wasn't ricardo? even that it uh-huh. wasn't even that i'm shaking my head because i would have the, i i'm with you i don't do anything mediocre but anything that is mediocre can be changed. And I don't want to get in a relationship where the only time we can be passionate or intense is when the, the when wrong kind fight. of emotion mm-hmm. it has to be invoked. I don't want to have to invoke anger for to show for you to show me the Absolutely. passion and intimacy That's you fair. have. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The mediocre sex can be changed. It just means we probably need to change the dynamic. We can do that. But the invoking of anger to get you to show me what I want to see, I'm not doing that. that that's not a good way to build a, a relationship which you ultimately want to be a marriage. Not doing that. Good question, You just Terry. sexier when you met. You never heard Neo say that? You do realize that's how abusive relationships start, too, right? Okay. Oh, <laughs> I just want to point Next that out. Terry, Uh-oh. you got yours. No, I don't. I don't. I think I do. I thought I was going. Oh, no, 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 no. Okay, oh, no, it's yeah. your turn. It's your turn. Okay, well, mine is very, is a snore fest. Uh, what is my definition of leadership? Ah, you <laughs> do not get to answer that. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. You, you, told, you told me I couldn't hop down, so okay. I'm going to answer that All question. Right. He didn't skip this one, did he? <laughs> he didn't. You see that? Uh uh-uh. uh. You said I can't opt out, so I'm going to answer the question. See that? He's being selective. Actually, I don't feel like there's an answer to this. I don't think there's one clear cut definition to leadership. I think that leadership is a, a synopsis of what your subordinates and your followers need and fulfilling that need because you're the standout. That's the best way I can define that. You know, if you're going to be a leader, you have to understand the dynamics of the people you're leading and cater to their needs and also not neglect your own. So that's my my straight lace definition of leadership. That was easy. Yay, go me! Yay, no. Boo. go me! <laughs> um, David, can I get some music for that? Yeah. <laughs> I said, go me! Yay, <laughs> hand claps! Yay! <laughs> Told you, babe. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> you know okay, what? Oh, it's, perfect. It's, it's, okay, David, you're fired. It's back on, it's back on me. <laughs> You're fired, David. You listen to Terry, you're fired. Uh, I'll, let you, I'll let you pick in. Just you know what all this Donald Trump talk, you hear how he said everybody's fired? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I have an interesting one. So we going back to Morgan? Mm. Um, sure. Oh Might as well. Because it, it's, it's definitely for women, you know. So it's, are you for or against abortion? Why and why not? I'm for it all the way. With it. Okay, and tell I us why. I believe in all forms of birth control. And I don't think that I would you rather I'd rather you because one, I'm really passionate about abortion because I I witnessed a lot of people go through that in college and I, it's a lot more common than people are willing to admit. Um, and I'm sympathetic to those people's feelings. I am all for it because I'd much rather you make that decision for yourself than bring a child into this world that you aren't prepared to take care of either one of you. And even if that's not the case, some people are raped and don't want those children. Some people are in abusive relationships and don't want those children. Some people are just living their best lives. They're re- they ready to thought it up and don't want children. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And that's their choice to make, not mine. It has nothing to do with me. But do you think there should be an age parameter on it? No. For what? I'm with it, but I think there has to be an age. I watched the, What's the uh, age parameter then? Got to be a consenting adult. I don't think a 15-year-old should be able to make a decision like that on their own. They shouldn't have been able to make a decision be- to get pregnant either, but here we are. I, I think that, like... I think that if there has to be an age on it, then you just can't tell people what to do. I you, I can't tell you what to do with your body, so you can't tell me what to do with mine. I mean, fifteen I, or not. I get it, but I guess because I saw somebody go through it and she did it, and then years later, she now, regretted it. She well, it's not even so much a regret. Psychologically, now she can't handle it because even though she's had other kids, she always thinks about the one that she aborted. Mm-hmm. And I'm just like, at a certain age, you you can't see that long term to say, you know what. You know, I'm I'm 14 now, and and I'm I'm releasing a life from my body, dis- despite the stage of that life. I'm dispelling a life from my body that was depending on me to get it to the nine months. 
can I really handle that when I get older and I have other kids and I think about, you know, who that child could have been? Because that's what she did. She was like, I don't know who that child could have been. You know, I, I didn't, I shouldn't have done this. But she was so young, she just did it. And there was nobody there required to be there to say, hey, let's, let's weigh your options. Because maybe, you know, your, your sister really wants a child and she can't have one. And y'all are the same bloodline. So why don't you have it and give it to her? It's still in the family. You still can see it if you want. Just somebody discuss the options. That's only my thing. Yeah. Uh -huh. Well, from I mean, that's just my my, my opinion thing. is you know speaking from a woman. And I'll just, before I even say this, you guys, the story that I shared early was not about me. Okay, it was not about me. <laughs> I must say you got a financing and we don't know nothing. Yeah, about? like that definitely wasn't about me. But um, just speaking from a woman who can't have kids or will have fertility issues or you know whatever. When I shared you guys about the endometriosis, oh, yeah. um. I'm just not for abortion only because I just feel like that if you're going to be out here thoughting it up, you need to just take responsibility for your actions. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, if that's what, if you know what I'm saying? If that happens, then it's just like, hey, this is what I have to do. I have to own up to it and just take care of my responsibility. So, no, I'm not for it. Like, well, I, I sit between you, I sit between the both of y'all because I get what you're saying. For a grown adult who's been thoughting it up and you're 30 years old and now you, you're pregnant, I don't think you should have the right to, to go, well, I don't, you know, blah, blah, blah. But at the same token, for the other examples you use, I agree with that. If a 14-year-old, you know, was raped by her uncle, then, she doesn't yeah. want to look at that child every day for the rest of her life. But I also think she shouldn't go to the abortion clinic by herself. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, you def oh no. Somebody should be. I don't think any, one thing I can definitely say, you shouldn't go through that by yourself whether you're 14 or 44. It's not fun for anybody involved. I've seen people. I've witnessed people have to do the at home method. I witnessed. witnessed you can people. do that. You yes. I think and you it's, can just it's take like a pill. You or take, but it's excruciating. You sit and it's it's not a light choice for anybody to make. And so I think that if you make that choice at fifteen or fifty six or whatever it is, if that's that's their choice, even if you are thotting it up to thought it up and then say <laughs> be responsible for your actions. That is a, this is, I'm, if I want to go get an abortion, this is my action that I'm choosing to be responsible for. Right. You know what I'm saying? And that's that's on me. It's not on anybody else. And you can't force me to keep a child or expect me to raise a child that I don't want and can't provide for. Or really but they have other, you know what yeah, I'm saying? They, they have, have other, yeah, you have other, you know, other methods for you that. Like your, you can't you just. You can give your child up. Yeah, like um, I just don't think that, you know what I'm saying? Especially for, like I was saying, for women who can't have kids. I would you know what I'm one. saying? So I would, I, I would have one. I would Abortion? Have a, yeah. And I've only, and I've seen people go through the hell of it and would still go through it. So in your head, that's an, if, in your head, that's an option. If I got pregnant today, I would, well, maybe not today, but had I gotten pregnant in school, absolutely. Without a doubt. It wouldn't even, I probably wouldn't even told my parents. It would not have been a, there would have been no doubt in my mind. I was getting one. So would you have gone by yourself or you were just like a best friend? Would you have confided in somebody and had them go No, with you? I probably, I mean, I'm a very private person anyway, so I, I'm just not really big on telling. And because the way of the way I've seen other people be scrutinized for it, if anything, I would have told people that I knew had already been through that experience. Because mm -hmm. then that way you can like share it with them. I mean, nobody else can really give you advice on that or relate to that. Because it's not something, I can't just go Google or call one of my friends and be like, so, so, like, you know, how you feel about me getting rid of this baby? Like, no, <laughs> yeah. that's not, that's, you know what I mean? That's a very, that's not something you take lightly. Well, I've know? changed on my stance because in my younger years, I, I, I have all these opinions. I have a lot of opinions. But as, as you, as we go through life and we learn more, we're in a generation now of knowing so much that, 50 years ago, nobody could have known. I mean, so we know so much. We know when life starts. And if we had that life in your hand or something, even if it was small or whatever, would you be willing to just do something to that, to it, once you know? Because now with our technology, which I was talking about technology earlier, we know a lot more. That's why this Internet's helping out everybody. People not doing that much reading. This is not a reading generation. They're really not as smart as the old people yeah. because they read. They read to get everything they got. They got it. It wasn't <laughs> quick. You had to go get it. You had to go down to your local library. You had to do a lot more to get knowledge. So the people getting it now, they just, they zipping through it, sitting mm -hmm. anywhere, anywhere. Okay. But on the, on, on the stands and I'm not hardcore, I wouldn't be no extremist because I've been on both sides. And I have to empathize with everybody for their reasons. Mm -hmm. So what you're saying is, I would empathize with that reason. Yeah. But on the end, at the end of it, with the technology we got, we're so smart now. We got a lot of knowledge, but no wisdom. 
So we got the knowledge. So the, the wisdom would tell you, hold up, that's a life. And if I don't want that life, I can get, I can birth it and be done with it. There's agencies to take it. There's places. But if I go to the other thing, like Ricardo was saying, it could be the remorse. It could also be that where do we decide, just like um, uh, capital punishment, Do should we be taking people's lives, even though they've done something? Are we the ones we didn't give the lives? Do we Are we supposed to take it? So it's always the issues of how you feel and what you think. And so on my stance now, I'm I'm not for it. I think a better question would be, are you pro-choice or yeah. or not? And I'm, I just want but you to I have empathize. the choice. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, and I, I can I'm totally not understand I'm not even it. saying that everybody that gets pregnant and doesn't want it should automatically resort to that. But mm -hmm. you should still, I should still have that choice to do whatever I want to do with my body. Well. And if, I, if I want to get an abortion, then that, I sh that should be available to me because I made I made that decision. Now, if I get pregnant and don't want to keep it, of course, you can always adopt. You can, there's adoption. There's many things. Mm -hmm. But I I deserve to have every answer presented to me. Well, Morgan, I think just because of the the subject, it's a little touchy, and everybody's like, you know, and no telling what our listeners, you know, how they may feel. So we're going to go ahead and go ahead and let you pull the last one since that was really mine. <laughs> I kind of pulled, and I just directly toured you. Okay. I want you to go ahead and pull the oh, last I one, and we can go right, and well, close it out. I something else I want to cover before we leave. Okay. I need a spicy one, baby. Okay. All right, I'm just going to grab this. Who is this for, you or, or Morgan? It's for it's me. It's for Morgan. It's for Morgan. Whew. If you could meet anyone famous, who would it be and why? Oh. <laughs> pick another one. Fine, pick another one. She, wants, she can't one. get anything spicy. Fine. It's just not meant oh, fine, to be. It's not meant to be, but I don't really like famous people anyway. Let's see. I, I'll pick one. We'll see what it says. Uh, why not take that back? Take off. What? I need my mm -hmm. man. Fine, you want it one spicy. There oh, you go. Okay, we can do spicy. Uh -uh. Would you rather have mad, I mean, mind blowing sex once a month or mediocre sex once a week? Once a month. Easy. <laughs> <laughs> once a month. Get me right once a month. <laughs> you know what, I'm <laughs> what I'm gonna do once a week? And Truth be told. And here's my disclaimer. Again, the opinions and the thoughts of these individuals <laughs> sitting around me are not the direct the opinion Man. and thoughts of the leadership blend with the host Ricardi Rice. I just want to put that out there because I always do. Once a month. All right, so before we leave, we have like five minutes left. It's something I did want to go over. Um, so I was telling the correspondents that uh, there was a law that was passed, if it doesn't get uh, any pushback, about domestic violence and the way people can move throughout a, a leasing contract. So uh, Melissa, Waller, Melissa Waller in winter of 2009 uh, found herself in a hostile relationship. Um, so she wanted to leave her then... Uh, significant other. So she went to the apartment complex and was trying to move out of the apartment only to discover the typical terms of a lease that if she breaks the lease, she's gonna be financially penalized or she'd have to move into another apartment in the same complex, which would still give her access to her. So this started uh, a legislation or just started lobbyists to try to change that particular law. So apparently it has been passed and it is HB 834 and it's the landlord and tenant, the termination of a rental or lease agreement under circumstances involving family violence uh, or domestic violence. It's been signed and basically it says that it's a general provision concerning landlord and tenant so as to provide for the termination of a rental or lease agreement for residential real estate under circumstances involving family violence to provide for definitions, uh, to provide for notice in terms of termination, to provide for applica applicability, applicability, to provide for related matters, to repeal conflicting laws and other purposes, meaning now domestic violence will be a clause by which you can break a lease. So if you get into a relationship and it goes bad and you need to break the lease because you guys are signed together, this is going to be a clause that is now included in leasing agreements across Georgia. So, <laughs> exactly. Hats off to them. Uh, it'll be an act as act to amend Article 1 of Chapter 7 of Title 44. So that's the gist of it. So it's a great win for women who are uh, products or byproducts of domestic violence. You know, hats off to all those individuals who were able to lobby and get that passed. It is a great day. I'm happy for, because this is not, this. believe it or not, this is not just uh, limited to women. You know, there Good. are, it's, it's not just limited to women. So men can be in domestic violence relationships. Uh, I'm assuming this will cover same sex. I'm not really sure. But I will go with the uh, technical definition of relationship. So just want to put that out there so to show you great things are happening as far as legislative. We talked about immigration and how 
forward that legislation is right now. But there are great bills being passed every day. Just wanted to give you that. And for those that want to look it up, it is HB834. And I had this look on my face that I found this website that I did not know existed that gives you uh, information on legislation. Did not know it existed. So it has this lovely little green check mark that says it's been passed by legislation. And if the governor signs it and he doesn't veto it within 40 days, at, after the end of the session, it becomes law on the bills effective July 1st. So I don't think it's going to get any pushback. We hope it doesn't. But it's a great day for women or byproduct of domestic violence. So great day, great day, great day. They are passing good legislation. And that's the importance of lobbyists because uh, Ms. War, Ms. War, Ms. Waller was the one that spearheaded this. She started this because she was a victim and she went through it. She could not get out of her lease without being penalized and affecting her credit. And people, remember, if you break a lease and you do not pay the money, it's it on goes your on your credit. credit. And it's going to show up as, I think it's an eviction or something like eviction, that. Eviction, It yeah. shows up as an eviction. You're not going to be able to get an apartment for years. And I've watched somebody do this. She didn't think about it. She just broke her lease. She was like, well, I'll just deal with it later. Now she can't get a place to live because it's on her credit. And I don't even know if that seven-year drop-off thing still works. The seven-year drop-off thing applies to, like, bankruptcies and foreclosures and things like of that nature. So I don't know if it, um, is about, I don't know if it counts for eviction. All right. So there you have it. All right, everybody. Final thoughts. We have a minute. So go and don't make your no. You know what? Go last, Chris. Morgan, you give your final thoughts. Y'all are great. I can't wait to do this again tomorrow. You mean <laughs> next Monday? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. So um, yeah, you guys, this is you know the one and only Miss Terry Michelle Ricardo's trying to fire um fire me. So I'll probably won't <laughs> see you guys next week. Are we really doing this? But um, peace and blessings and love you all. Terry Thank you. has landed on another show, so I want to release her to do that show. It's called Letting Babies Grow Up. Thank you. She's fan for yeah. life. She's fan for life. Exactly. Congratulations, She's Terry. Well, look, Short as we're Chris. talking here, just go out there, make an impact. Don't do anything mediocre, <laughs> and just have yourself a blessed week. Don't let don't let things uh, hold hold you down as far as um circumstances remember circumstances is just like the weather it changes and you don't have to make any major decision in that circumstance just just pause give yourself a couple of couple of days on some things and and talk go around somebody you know who's positive because we got enough negative friends and, and negative media and go to the website ricecommunity.com rice with a w see all the great things i have to update it because some great things are happening me and tara will be going to an event tomorrow with uh the one and only al sharpton and sunday me and morgan will be going to a gala to represent ibnx so you will see all that on the website so definitely go check it out ricecommunity.com you guys have a great week see you again next monday same time same place on the leadership blend with your host ricardo d rice Radio.